Acts chapter 13 is where we're at. Uh, chapter 13, verse 4 is where we're going to start. And here is the title of my sermon, The Church's Job, Call It Like God Sees It. That's the church's job. We've been looking at the book of Acts and asking ourselves the question, what does it look like and how do we be a Jesus-filled church? And, and, and we get one of the answers to that question here in our text this morning, the church's job is, is and there are several, there's to, to do many things, to be the family of God and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, it's the church's job to have the posture of humility that says we're going to call it like God sees it. And, and the world will accuse us of being um, bigots and being uh, 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 discriminators and being haters and being ironically arrogant. And, and here's the reality of it is. It's the humble posture that says, I'm going to call it how God sees it. It's the arrogant posture that says, I'm going to call it how I see it. And, and baseline fundamental Christianity is how we see the world doesn't matter and doesn't count in the end. How God sees the world matters and counts in the end. And so this, the first step towards Jesus, the first step toward God, the first step toward walking in the Spirit is, is to say, I want to know, I have a hunger for seeing and knowing how God sees the world. I, I have a fundamental suspicion of my instincts and how I see the world and what I think and my opinions, because my instincts and my opinions and, and my vision are tainted by my flesh and tainted by my hypocrisy and tainted by my sin and tainted by all the stuff that gets mixed up in our heads and our hearts that's rooted in sin. We want to know the world, see the world, how God sees the world. That's the fundamental posture of the church, and that's the job of the church to say, to call it how God sees it. And we're going to see an example of that in our text this morning. Acts chapter 13, verse 4. I'll read from my Bible. You can read from the screen if you don't have one. Chapter 13, verse 4. The two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. Pause there real quick. Up to the three verses before, we saw the worshipers or the Christians had gathered to worship and in prayer and worship, God spoke to them through the Holy Spirit to set aside uh, Barnabas and Saul who becomes Paul for the work of ministry. That was last week. If you missed that message, go back. It's free on our app or online. You can check that out. Uh, 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 a sermon looking at what it means to be called by God and respond to the call of God and, and how that works. That was last week. So these men have been affirmed by the people of God. They've had their lands, hands laid upon them. We commissioned them to be proclaimers of the truth, to go around the world preaching the gospel. They take off to do just that. That's where we catch up in the story. Verse 5, when they arrived at uh, Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. Now, I have any reference to proclaiming the word of God or preaching the gospel uh, circled or highlighted in red in my Bible, and you'll notice there's a lot of red in the book of Acts because that's, that's all they're doing. They're, everywhere the church goes, the church is teaching, proclaiming, and preaching the good news of the gospel and how that connects to all of life. That's what they're, they're not there to, it, this is really remarkable. N nowhere do we see apostles showing up and emphasizing social justice. They show up preaching the good news of the gospel. Now in Acts 6, we say, hey, we've got to take care of the widows and orphans, so let's get some deacons going. But our job as ministers of the gospel is to first preach and proclaim the good news of the gospel. Is caring for widows and orphans a bad thing? No, it's a very good thing. As followers of Christ, we should care for those who are down and out. But here's the deal. If you give people cups of cold water for 50 years and then they die and go to hell, you didn't really help them ultimately, did you? So the primary job of the church is to preach and proclaim the goodness of the gospel. And when that happens, lo and behold, more people care for each other. And many people who are down and out get a helping hand up. And they're not down and out anymore. Because much of oftentimes when people are, are down and out, it's because there's bondage and sin and slavery and addiction. And, and, and the gospel breaks those things and frees them from those things. And all of a sudden, they're not in postures of needing help. They're in a posture of being able to give help. Because the gospel moves people from brokenness to health in all areas of life. And for those who are legitimately poor, not illegitimately or, or unrighteously poor, for those who are legitimately poor, the church, when it's being built up by the word of God, will reach out and help them. Like I talked to a, a couple this, this week, married 63 years, and all they could talk about was how sweet God had been and how kind he had been to them. And how every time they reached out a helping hand and brought someone who was needy, they, they said, we, we had probably 20, 30, 40, 50 kids in our home through the years whose parents had abandoned and before the state take them away and you got to jump through 97,000 hoops. Before, it's like the state wasn't there. We were there because we were the church. Novel idea. 
They show up, they proclaim and preach the word of God in the Jewish synagogues, and John was with them as their helper. Verse 6, they traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish, Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an, an attendant of the proconsul Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. This is going to be very important to our story. They're being sent uh, uh, for by a, uh, the most powerful man in the Roman government in that area. He wants to hear about the word of God. Our story continues, verse 8. Uh, but uh, Alimus, who's the same as uh, Bar-Jesus, the sorcerer, for what his name, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Alimus and said, and this is where you just got to love Paul, uh, because this is not how most Christians, most uh, Bible teachers would respond to um, resistance today, because today the false teaching uh, that Christians are to be nice has saturated the church, and quite frankly, that's not the highest virtue of Christianity. And so Paul turns to him and decides not to be nice, but to rather speak the truth, which we think is love. To be loving is to be better than to be nice. Verse 10, you are a child of the devil. How's that for a tweet? <laughs> just, let's just go right to the bone and call, you are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. Not a few things of a right. You are an enemy of everything that is right. God's word is right. God's word describes and explains how the world was intended by God to work. If you oppose the word of God, you're not just getting a few things wrong, you're getting everything wrong. Do you see it there? If you're opposing God at one point, you're opposing God at all points. If you disagree with God on one thing, you disagree with God on everything. I was talking to someone recently, and, and they're blatantly living in sexual sin and calling themselves a Christian, and they don't think it's a big deal. It's, it's, a, it's actually a huge deal. Because you can't be like, like, I love Jesus here, 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 and here, but with my sexuality, I'll do whatever I think is best. Well, you're playing God there, and you're opposing God's design. And if you oppose God in one area, you're opposing him in all areas. You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. You will never stop perverting the right, excuse me, will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? What's interesting to note is that people who are false prophets, people don't see them as false prophets. People outside of a work of the Holy Spirit, through the word of God, they, they won't see this person or this institution as a false prophet because by nature of being a false prophet, a false prophet is deceiving people with trickery, which means they don't know what's happening to them. And so part of the job of the church and the prophet and the word of God is to speak truth so that people's minds can be saturated and then filtered with and then, and then renewed so they can now see what they thought was nice as what it is, satanic, demonic, devilry and lies. He continues, now the hand of the Lord is against you, which you never want a prophet of God to say, right? Because if God's hands against you, newsflash, you don't have a prayer. I don't care how smart you are or, 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 or how many degrees you have next to your name or how much money you got in the bank. If God's hands against you, you're totally screwed. And that's what he says here. Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. I was, I was, uh, I, I, I sat on my back porch yesterday to attempt to take a nap, and that didn't work. So, I, so I went inside and took a nap. <laughs> it was amazing. How should I ring in forty four? Take a nap. So I did. It was awesome. But I was on the back porch. I closed my eyes, and you close your eyes, and what was what was blinding me? The sun. Even when you close your eyes, it's like bright. And I had the thought, this guy was so blind, the sun didn't even bother him. That's like dark, dark. Okay, God, when you, God blinds you, you blind. <laughs> Immediately mist and darkness came over him and he groped about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. There's a lot, there's a lot of metaphorical truth going on here, right? We want to look at the, the word. We also want to look through the word to what the word is teaching us about today. When you oppose the word of God, 
you are by definition blind. And the irony is, is many people who are opposing the word of God set themselves up as experts to lead other people, when in reality, in the spiritual realm, you need to see them as blind and groping about. And they parlay their blindness and groping about as you should follow me, which means if you follow them, you too are blind and groping about. Verse 12, when the pro saw what had happened, this is amazing, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. What I love about that verse is he wasn't amazed at the miracle. He was amazed at the God who gave the miracle. And, and that's really important to note because in the book of Acts, there are a lot of supernatural miracles. And never in the book of Acts is the emphasis put on the supernatural miracles. The emphasis is always put on the God who gave the supernatural miracle. Miracles were given for the sake of waking people up to the power of God over creation. And we see that happen here. So in my Bible, I have, and I've told you this before, I have everything that represents um, resistance to the word of God in blue and everything that represents um, the advance of the kingdom in yellow. And we're going to see a pattern in how that works here in a moment. So a few takeaways for us. I got eight. In fact, we'll go quick. Number one, gospel proclamation will face demonic resistance. That is the pattern of the book of Acts. And most of what I'm going to say today, you've heard me say before, if you've been coming for the last few months, because there is a pattern that gets established in the book that we're to see and learn from. Gospel proclamation will face demonic resistance. So much so that the more you read the book, the more resistance will comfort you if you're in spiritual leadership or part of a local church. And, and what I mean by that is we, we don't ask for it, we don't hunt it down, we, we don't wish it upon ourselves or, or anyone else, and we don't necessarily even enjoy it when it comes, but it can be a measure of comfort to say, okay, well, at least we know we're going the right direction. Because if, like, if you're like marching, I'm marching for Jesus, and I'm all about what, and you get, you know, 10 feet down the road, and no one's shot at you yet, you should go, I'm marching for Jesus, I'm marching. Am I, am I going the right way here? <laughs> because if you're following Jesus, especially today, you won't get shot at. And we see that here. It's the pattern of the book of Acts. Gospel proclamation will face demonic resistance. And I use the word demonic very intentionally. It's not ideological difference. It's not political difference. It's not differences of human opinion. It's demonic resistance. Satan hates God, Satan hates the image of God in man, and Satan hates when God's truth is proclaimed. And so he attacks it wherever he can. Number two observation, takeaway, is that there are such things as false prophets, and sometimes they're in positions of power. Let's just put that on the table for a minute. There are such things as false prophets. A false prophet is someone who is motivated by evil spirits and oftentimes paid to attack truth. And when they, when they hear truth or when they see truth, they malign the truth giver, they attack the character of the one speaking, they set up all sorts of illogical uh, uh, red herring arguments, and they criticize and malign and try to tear down the one who is speaking the truth because they're there to undermine the message of truth. They are false prophets. And sometimes they're in positions of power. One of the things that Pastor Kyle said when we, as we were going through COVID, and I, I appreciate what he said a lot. He was very wise. He said, we need to cultivate a healthy um, skepticism towards people in authority with degrees behind their name, proclaiming to be experts, telling us how to live our lives. Now, as Christians, right, we believe in authority structures. We believe in, that you can't be in authority unless you're submitted to authority. And so authority is a big deal to us as followers of Jesus in the world God made. We believe that God gave the man authority and responsibility in the household over his home. We believe that God gave husband and wife authority over their children to be the, the ones who have the final say in discipling and shepherding and leading those children, which is radically controversial and actually anti much government legislation in this state today. 
We're going to talk more about that. So we, have, we, we, we believe that, that God gives elders to the church to exercise authority, spiritual authority, to maintain the culture of that church, the integrity and ethos of that church, and to proclaim with authority the word of God. We absolutely believe in authority, yes and amen. And all we see in the book of Acts is God's people standing up against and resisting demonic evil authority. And so you can't say to be a Christian is to roll over and go along with everything every expert ever said. No, that would be foolish and stupid. We did a study on, on all the things that experts have proclaimed to be true, starting from 50, the 1950s all the way up, and it was laughably hysterical, all the things that Pastor Kyle dug up that, that, that experts said are true and, and scientifically proven to be fact, and, and, and 50 years later, 60 years later, 10 years later, where it's totally laughable, right? I mean, the Surgeon General was encouraging people to smoke cigarettes in the 50s, right? I mean, because the experts said it was safe. Well, we know that's not true. Why would we take hook, line, and sinker everything that those same experts are saying today? There are such things as false prophets, and sometimes they're in positions of power. Just because they have a website, just because they're a social media influencer, just because they have a bunch of degrees behind their name, just because they have an official position, just because they have a following, does not mean necessarily that what they're saying is true. God's called us to know the Word of God, to walk in the, in the Spirit of God, and then to discern truth from fiction, truth from lies. And sometimes false prophets are in positions of power, just like Bar-Jesus was here. He was the right-hand guy to the most powerful uh, Roman in that area. He had power. It did not mean he was right. Number three, takeaway. Gospel proclamation sometimes includes rebuking the demonic. Gospel proclamation sometimes includes rebuking the demonic. And it goes along with my, my fourth point, so I'll put them both on the table and we'll talk about them. Sometimes in order to declare what you're for, you have to articulate what you're against. Now, there's a little saying, and, and it's cliche because it, there's much that's true about it, and depending on the context I'm in, I would probably emphasize one or the other. But the saying goes, we don't want to be known so much by what we're against, but by what we're for, right? And, and in some contexts, I totally agree with that because I've been around church context specifically where all they talk about is what they're against. It's like, bro, it's like, this is obnoxious and it gets old and it's tiring. I'm like, ugh, what are we for? Jesus, the glory of God, proclaiming the gospel, salvation, being experienced, transformed lives, spirit-filled people, loving the poor, healing for the sick, strengthening of marriages, raising of, of young men and young women. We're, we're for a ton of stuff, right? The sanctity of marriage and the, the glory of the family and blah, blah. We're for a lot of things. And sometimes when the assault is so relentless and the deception runs so deep and the trickery so slippery, in order to helpfully proclaim the truth, you have to outline what that truth is that by nature then sets you against other things. And so we see here in, 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 this, in this text that Paul's like preaching the gospel, proclaiming the gospel, and this guy, this false prophet is twisting the truth and denying their authority and using trickery to undermine uh, the truth of God as it being received by this pro-council. And so Paul's talking to the pro-council, and pretty soon he's like, hey, you! And he looks right at the source of the evil, right at the source of the lies. He points his finger in their nose, and he unloads. And it won't be the last time he does it. And so God calls the prophets of God to speak the truth of God to the people in the culture, and sometimes to turn on the deceivers and say, you... Shut up. You are evil. You are wrong. You are devil. You are lies. You are darkness. You are deceit. You are trickery. You are death. You are destruction. You are evil. And just call it out like he sees it. And so we want to be known by who we're for and what we're for, yes. And sometimes by default, that will require us to articulate what we're against. Number five, uncompromising and unflinching truth, articulation of truth, will always help someone. Isaiah says that the word of God goes out and never returns void. The word of God is efficacious. The word of God is powerful. The word of God doesn't go out and, and just dissipate. The word of God always go out, goes out with effect. 
And yet sometimes when the word of God is preached and proclaimed and resistance comes and, and, and the noise from the, the peanut gallery rises, it's like, gosh, it just feels like we're losing. And what we see here is the word of God always returns fruitful if the speaker of the truth remains uncompromising and unflinching. If the word of God is proclaimed, the word of God is attacked, and then the church starts apologizing for the word of God, and making excuses for the word of God and, and, and editing the word of God, the word of God no longer has power because it's not the word of God. It's a diluted version of a different gospel. What, what brings gospel fruit, what calls dry bones to life is the unadulterated, the unedited, the unfiltered word of God proclaimed in all of its potency and all of its power. And we see here, Paul and Barnabas proclaiming the truth. Deceitful trickery comes along and tries to water down. They turn on them, you devil, you who are opposed to all that is right, will you ever stop trying to pervert the word of God? The answer is, is no, because the question was rhetorical. You're going to be blind. I'm done with you. I'm back on point. And what happens? The guy gets saved. Now, this, this is, a, this is a, a, a really kind of funny example, but do but you mind if I show the Facebook example I used Thursday night of you? Yeah, yeah. So, so Adam has, has, has forayed back into social media a little bit. You know what I mean? Just, just tip, 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 toe, just a little bit. Just dip back in. Just like, oh, man, I get back out there. And we have this conversation. How should we get on there? We should just fireballs. No, nah, no, nah, I'll get better use of my time. So he's like, I'm going to tiptoe back in. Just happy pictures, family, you know, whatever. And pretty soon, rah, the crazies come out, you know? And he's like, gosh. No, I'm obligated to answer. Not that I think I'm going to change this Hanyaker's mind, but because vulnerable people are watching and need to see how a man of God responds to deceitful trickery and devilry posed as sophistication and compassion. No, no, you're a liar. What you stand for, what you promote, what you believe is from the very pit of hell, and we're not going to mince words and play games and pretend to say anything less than that. Paul preaches the truth, it's resisted, he turns on the deceiver, unloads on them, and in so doing, those who are watching are amazed at the power of God and they're saved. Because when we articulate the truth of God with unflinching courage, it will help someone. It might not help the one we're confronting, it'll help someone who's listening and watching. In fact, Paul articulates why he went about the work of apologetics. He says later, we'll see in, 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 in Acts, he's like, I, I, have, I have no confidence I'm going to help anyone I'm arguing with, but I do it for the sake of strengthening the brethren who are listening and watching. Number six, takeaway. God uses enemy threats and obstacles as stepping stones for greater work. The, 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 this is what I love. Resistance comes to the word of God, and we'd all think, oh, shoot. I was hoping that the pro council might get saved. It's like, no, no, no. It's the, it's, it's, the very, it's the very work of resistance that God uses as energy to leverage his, for, his further work. So, for instance, when you look around, when you look around today, there are plenty of reasons to be wildly discouraged with the kind of evil and devilry and deceit and trickery that's being spread on all social media platforms, that's being pushed and promoted by all sorts of agencies with money and power and influence over all areas of age, ages of life, things that are being codified as policy into the very fabric of our culture, it'd be, be easy to be discouraged and then just remind yourself, okay, right, the devil always overplays his hand. And he'll even hear me say this and he won't get it. He won't change his tactics. Because here's the deal, you cannot kick against the goads and you cannot push against creation before creation eventually pushes back. Watching a, a lecture by a woman by the name of, of, of Camille Paglia, and she's a sweetheart and I, I really like her. She's like a 74-year-old lesbian, non-transitioned, uh, transgender professor at Yale. I mean, she's all sorts of messed up. But her honesty and her brain power and the book, she's super fascinating personally. I listened to like four lectures. 
And I listened to her talk. She's, she's a wildly libertarian, and she's highly critical of the whole LGBTQI alphabetical soup movement. And she can articulate why. And it, it, it's stunning. And one of the things she says, she says, look, look, like I have never once felt like a, a woman in my life, whatever. But had there been a government mechanism in place to sweep me up and shove me down the road of hormonal and surgical therapy that would have permanently destroyed my human body, she's like, I would have never recovered. She's like, thanks, and she literally in the lecture, she's like, thanks be to God, who she doesn't think is this. Thanks be to God, there was not this massive, highly funded mechanism to sweep me up, take me away from my family and my parents, and shove me down this road to, to permanent destruction of my body before I was even believing that Santa Claus wasn't real, or I, I would have, it would have destroyed my life. And then she said this, very, very fascinating. She said, so her, her studies were in transgenderism, androgyny. She, she was fascinated with androgyny. And so she spent 45, 50 years studying androgyny across historic cultures. And here's what she said in a lecture last year. And, 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 and it's funny because she's, she's one of the LGBTQ crowd and they hate her because she calls it like she sees it. And quite often she's calling it how God sees it. It's, it's bizarre. Here's what she says. When you study historic cultures, the embrace of androgyny is always the, the signal, the telltale, undeniable signal of endgame for that culture. It always signals endgame and, and the inevitable unraveling of that culture. She said, which is why I've been railing against feminism that's been attacking masculinity for 30 years. Masculinity, listen to her words, it's beautiful, masculinity is needed, it's the men who built the roads and built the cities and, and, and defeated the evil and built the walls and defended them. Men have done remarkable things throughout history, sacrificing their life on the perimeter to protect the, to protect the village, and now we're attacking them? If we attack masculinity and masculinity goes away, it is over for that village because the, there's no one to fight off the hordes. This is a lesbian, non-surgically transitioned trans person saying, we need men. I'm, I'm, I'm like, I like her. <laughs> she would be like pro Stronger Man Nation and everything we say. It's, it's wild. She said, here's the ironic. You, you look at Persia, you look at the Greek culture, you look at Roman culture. The telltale sign of that culture unraveling and coming to its end was the embrace of androgyny, meaning there are no men, there are no women, heterosexuality, whatever, homosexuality, who cares? Boys can be girls, girls can be boys. And she said, it's always done in the name. You read the, you read the literature, it's always done in the name. It starts in the, it, with the elite. It's done in the name of sophistication and compassion. Isn't that ironic? Friends, welcome to Western culture's endgame. We are there. We are going to watch in our lifetime the unraveling of Western culture. And the only thing that stands between the complete disintegration of Western culture is the Word of God. And if we apologize for the Word of God, if we edit the Word of God, if we close the book of the Word of God, if out of compassion and love and niceties we stop proclaiming the Word of God to all of the evil in the world, we will participate in the collapse of Western culture and will be held culpable before God. These are big days. These are exhilarating days. These are amazing days to be alive. I'm not discouraged. I'm not overwhelmed. I'm actually like, oh, this is kind of cool because it's bigger than me. This, the, 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 the seeds were in the soil of what's happening today long before I showed up on the scene. The only question remains, what am I going to do in the midst of this story? And my answer is quite simple. I'm going to preach and proclaim the Word of God. I'm going to strengthen the church and arm the church to go into the fray with the truth of God anchored in their minds and in their hearts, uncompromising, unflinching, confessing sin, calling out evil and trickery and deceit, and just letting the chips fall. And friends, it's exciting. And I, the, the, the moment COVID began, I, I went into a deep sense of mourning because I, you realize what's happening. We're not going back from this, and this is accelerating 
decay. Because crisis is opportunity for centralization of power. And histor- history has proven the Persian Empire, Greek Empire, Roman Empire, the more power is centralized, like, the worse it goes for everyone. And then eventually that, that, that culture collapsed because the oppression, the evil, becomes so, so oppressive, so heavy, uh, so cataclysmically horrible that resistance rises up and, 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 and rebels and revolutions happen. And then, and then power structures change, and it doesn't end typically the atrocities and tyranny. It just changes who's, who's doing it against the other. And so these are wild days to be alive. I, I, I have little or no hope for the future Western civilization. And I'm like, you know what? Worse things have happened than, than, for, than entire systems collapse because when those things happen, God always preserves a remnant. And what comes out of those ashes is always and inevitably spiritual revival. So I think these are amazing days to be alive. These are exciting days to be alive. And the necessity of you being in the Word of God. And if you're watching online, out of town, you getting in a gospel preaching church, the necessity of you walking in the Spirit and growing in your truth chops has never before been more important. Otherwise, you'll be swept away by the trickery and the deceit. You'll be lulled to sleep. You'll become the frog in the kettle. Many of you have been in, in pots of water that, that were just fine and have missed the fact that in the last five years, someone turned the heat up and that thing's boiling now. That's the inevitable reality, and there'll be a grieving process for you as you walk through the reality of what you're losing and what you'd hope to be and what you used to be a part of is not what it's going to be in the future. And then once you go through that, and, and I understand that, get over it and move on and start acting courageously where you're at with what you now know. That's what it's going to look like for the church to move forward in the days to come. And friends, don't be discouraged because God always used enemies and obstacles as stepping stones for his greater work. Because he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. Thanks be to God. These are amazing days to be alive. Amazing days to be alive. (laughs) Seven, spiritual hunger begets spiritual revelation. Look at the text. He summoned, he was a man of intelligence, and he summoned Paul and Barnabas because he wanted to hear the word of God. He had a spirit-born hunger. So the the spirit goes forward and prepares the soil, and the word of God is the seed that goes into the soil. Here's the deal. If the soil isn't prepared, the seed won't get planted. And so what we need to be praying for is the Spirit of God to cultivate and till more receptive soil. Our our job is to preach and proclaim the the, the Word of God and to teach truth. My experience has been when it's not received, there's no amount of tilling you can do to change that hard soil to soft soil. I I just have less and less an appetite to get involved in people's mess and, and more and more conviction. I'll stand back, love them, call them to repentance, proclaim truth over them, and then let the chips fall in their own life. Because until God tills the soil, the seed's just going to sit there and dry up and die and not sprout righteousness. So it's a sovereign work of God's grace where God tills the soil, softens the soil, turns over the soil, prepares it for them to receive the word of truth that is the seed of God's truth for righteousness to sprout in their heart. Spiritual hunger begets spiritual revelation. So my question to you is very simple. Are you hungry for the word of God? Do you have a hunger for the Word of God? You're like, bro, I'm here. Okay, I got it. You're here. You you probably got that. One of the things I love about Grace Seed Church is you show up week in, week out, journal, Bible, pen, let's go. You're ready to receive. You're hungry for the Word of God. You're not here for a personality or program. You're here for the unadulterated, pure Word of God. And that is a gift. It's a privilege to walk through life with hundreds and thousands of people that are hungry for the Word of God. And here's the deal. The more you hunger for it, the more you'll see it and receive it. Hunger for the Word of God begets revelation from the Word of God. He was hungry to to hear the Word, and no amount of false teaching could deter him from it. Paul spoke the Word of God. He rebuked the evil ones, and in the process, this guy got saved. Last observation is simply this. Spiritual hunger results not only in receiving the Word, but in sending the Word. When a people are hungry for the Word of God, they'll receive it, and as soon as they receive it, it has the effect of boomeranging through their mind, down into their heart, and then back out through their life. The Word of God never goes and just sits and then dies. The the Word of God goes and implants itself and changes the one in which it's uh, abiding in, and then it comes out in everything they say and do. And I just love this about the Word of God. I love this about the church because I don't have to do all the work. I just got to get the Word of God in you, and then you go out there and do, do all the work because the Word of God does not go into silos. 
It does not go into cul-de-sacs. You are not a cul-de-sac. You are a conduit for God's word to go in you and then through you as it changes you. And so we see here that at one point, Paul was resistant to the word of God. And then God softened his heart by supernatural work of the Holy Spirit so that Paul, instead of hating God's word, loved God's word, and in receiving God's word, he became a receptacle to now pass God's word through. So here is two types of people. There's only two types of people in the world. There's only two, very binary. Haters of the word and those who are hungry for the word. There's only, only two people. And if you're indifferent to the word of God, you hate it. You're like, well, that's kind of strong language. Friends, follow this logic. It's quite simple. If you're indifferent to your wife and what she says, do you love her? No. It's an act of hate to say, I don't like you. I don't, I don't want to listen to you. I don't want to know what you say. I don't care what you say. What you say is foolish. What you say is, is stupid. What you say is not worth listening to or giving my time to. Those are, those are the acts of hate. So if you are indifferent to the word of God, you are a hater of the word. And there's different ways to hate the Word of God. You can actively preach against it, or you can in indifferently blow it off. You can be resistant to it when it's brought to you. You can make cases against it on your blog. You can avoid it by keeping yourself busy so as not ever have time to be here or be in community or open it up in your home. All those are expressions of hating the Word of God because you're rejecting it. And you don't reject things that you're hungry for, and you don't reject things that you love. And so my question is very simple for you. Do you have a hunger for the Word of God? Or are you a hater of the Word of God but with how you're living your life? Never opening it up in your home. Never reading it over your family. Never studying it for yourself. Never putting yourself under its teaching and proclamation. There's only two categories. So the question is simple. Which one are you? Which one are you? And the prayer you want to offer is, Lord, my flesh wants to resist your word. The, the evil one wants to convince me that it's foolish, that I should hate it. I need your spirit to give me a hunger for your word. And friends, when you utter that prayer, God answers every time. I, I, I've been so encouraged by the amount, and I've said this multiple times, by the amount, and it continues to happen, by the amount of, of men in particular, but women as well, coming up to me and saying, I don't know where it came from, but I have had a renewed hunger for the Word of God I have never had before. I'm hearing this from people who've been walking with Jesus for 35 years and people who've been walking with Jesus for 35 seconds. It's the mark of revival. It's the mark of the Spirit of God moving and working when he gives you a renewed hunger for spiritual revelation. Because here's what happens. You, begin, you get distracted with life. You get busy with life. And you think, yeah, I got a good repository, you know, a, a good, um, you know, kind of build up of wisdom. I'll just draw from when I need it. And you begin drifting. And all of a sudden, your thinking is being diluted and polluted with a little bit of Bible and a little bit of your thoughts. And then you, you, you're busy and you, you make it to church every four, five, six weeks. If you got time on your busy schedule. And pretty soon there's more of your thoughts and man thoughts and Satan thoughts than God thoughts in your, in your head. And then the hunger for God's word begins to, begins to wane and you start liking the sound of the hearing of your own voice because your own voice will always give you what you want. And the word of God is going to resist what you want. The word of God is going to confront you and the word of God is going to call you out on your sin. The word of God is going to require you and, and invite you to repent. And those can be hard and uncomfortable. So who wants to do that? So you drift in your mind and then you find people who support your drifting because they're drifting as well. And now you have a, a party of fools. You have a coalition of fools. Friends, 50 people can run off the cliff just as easy as one. Don't think just because there's 300 of us here or 3,000 on this closed Facebook uh, page or 3 million of us in this movement that there is not a cliff big enough to, to, to help all of us over the abyss. So, 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 so don't quantify rightness with mightness. I think I just made up that word. You know what I mean? Rightness with crowd. So right now, your heart yet, am I hungry for the Word of God or have I been demonstrating I'm a hater of the Word of God? The, 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 there are really no shades here. It's one or the other. And, and, and the prayer of the righteous and the prayer of the hungry, so like, like, notice, the pro-counsel wasn't, he didn't have a degree in theology. 
He wasn't the most sophisticated Christian on the walking planet. He wasn't even a Christian. But, but pre-conversion, he had a spirit-born hunger for the word of God. You can be steeped in sin. You can be far from God. And God can still give you a hunger for his word. Pray for it. Ask for it. Cultivate it. Pursue it. God, give me a hunger for your word. It might be the most important prayer you pray. Because being in church doesn't mean jack. If you don't have a hunger for the word of God that keeps you open to the, the voice of God and keeps you attuned and discerning to the evil voices that would cause you to be deceived and tricked by false prophets telling you that sin's okay, that, that ideology isn't that harmful, it's okay to compromise here, what's the big deal? Everybody's doing it. Friends, that's the path of death. And God's word gives eyes to see the path of light. Your word is a light unto my path. And so my, my challenge, my exhortation, my encouragement to you this morning is, is to reflect on your life without condemnation, without guilt and shame, just, just honest reflection, am I living as one who is hungry for the word of God or have I been tacitly acting like I'm a hater of the word of God by rejecting it or being indifferent to it? And friend, my, my, my sweet invitation, my, my loving encouragement to you is to be someone who is hungry for the word of God. You're like, well, I don't know where to start. Call Pastor Adam, call Pastor Chris. If you're a dude, get in a Stronger Men group, grab a soldier, grab a farmer, show up at Stronger Men conference, grab athletes, coming soon, like soon to be released. Like, like there are ways for you to cultivate a hunger for the word of God here in our church family. Which one are you? I'll end with this. It's an encouraging word. The bank can come on out. There's a historic pattern we see in the book of Acts. I've been referencing it all, all morning. I'll just explicitly put, put it for you here so that you can remain encouraged by where we're at in the culture. Because friends, we are living in a time that is a, is a bull market for gospel proclamation. There has never before in my lifetime been so many people hungry, starving for truth, and the lines have never been so distinctly drawn, thanks be to God. The darker the culture gets, the brighter the gospel shines, and that's good news for those who are looking for hope, swimming in the vast sea of the, the, the darkness of their sin. So thanks be to God, the lines are being distinctly drawn, and the contrasts are distinctly different. The beacons of hope stand brighter. It becomes easier to see where to go for hope. Here's the pattern historically that we see in the New Testament. Number one, bold proclamation. Bold proclamation. So, this is crazy. This is why I color code my Bible, right? Green is for any time the Holy Spirit moves or speaks in his people, in my Bible. Just make it whatever color you want. It's, I think Holy Spirit's green because I think my mom used green as a kid. So I well, worked for her. She's amazing. I could, I could stand a lot more like my mom. So let's go with green. Green. Red is gospel proclamation preaching of the gospel, proclaiming of the gospel, teaching the powerful word of God unapologetically, without flinching. And then blue connotates attack and resistance. And so here is the pattern we see in, in, in the New Testament. The Spirit of God moves on his people to boldly proclaim the word of God, and then that brings vicious attack. Not gentle resistance, not let's have a civil conversation, vicious, demonic, character assassination and attack. And then, and then there's a decision tree that, that, that arises in the lives of the believer. Do we cave to the attack? Do we retreat in cowardice? Do we apologize and, 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 and kick the, the dirt for what we said? Our bad, well, no, no, you're misunderstanding. We weren't saying that the, 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 the androgynous transgender movement is evil. We're just saying it's, it, it, it's maybe misunderstood. No, 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 it's evil. It, it is evil. It is from the pit of hell. It's it's after our children and our families. It's confusing entire generations of children, and it will have its destructive effect to the end of the culture we've known as Western civilization. So, bold proclamation of truth, vicious attack from the pit of hell, a decision. Stand or fall. And what we see is, wherever there is courageous perseverance, we declare the truth, the winds of attack come, and we stand unapologetically, humbly, happily, winsomely, courageously, what always inevitably comes on the other side of that storm is 
gospel harvest. And so green for the spirit of God, red for gospel proclamation, blue for demonic resistance attack, and in every portion of my Bible, yellow for the church advances. That's the pattern of, of, of the book of Acts. That's the pattern of the kingdom of God that we're participating in right now. Let us never back away from bold proclamation. Let us anticipate and not be surprised when vicious attack comes. Let us courageously stand and persevere in the storm and then let us with hope and anticipation watch because friends, gospel harvest is coming. That's why I'm saying, hey, you know what? Be encouraged. We win. It's an awesome time to be alive. I want to invite you to stand. We're going to respond in worship to the word of God. And we're going to respond with the act of worship of communion this morning. And here's my invitation. Before you come to communion, if God's been convicting you of your cowardice, if God's been convicting you of your silence, if God's been convicting you of your hatred and indifference to the word of God, if God's been convicting you of the need to grow in your hunger for God, you confess that to the Lord. Father, ah, so good to be under your word. Thank you for your conviction. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for the sight to see where I've been wrong, where I've been off, where I've been silent, where I've been indifferent. And Lord, give me eyes to see your word and eyes to see your truth. And Lord, give me a hunger for it. You, you just confess. I mean, are you ever hungry enough for the word of God? No. Like, Lord God, give me a deeper hunger. I, I, I met the sweetest 84-year-old woman on, on Friday. Not met. I, I, I ran into her. I've known her my whole life. Phyllis, how you doing? Josh, how you doing? We talked, talked, talked. What? I could not get her to shut up <laughs> about what she was learning in the Word of God. And she's been a student of the Word of God for 50 plus years. Friends, there is more to discover and more to see and more to know and more to own and more to embrace and more to celebrate in the word of God than you have yet to see, including the guy who's talking. And so my prayer for us is that God would, as a church, collectively give us and increase our hunger. It's an insatiable hunger for his word that begets spiritual revelation and spiritual sight. So Father in heaven, as we respond to your word with worship, as we respond to your word by coming to the communion table for all those who believe and all those who place their faith in Jesus to come to the, the communion table and take the bread that represents the body of Christ and to take the, the juice that represents the blood of Christ and to with that act proclaim the good news that Jesus is the Son of God Jesus did die for my sins. Jesus did rise again. I have accepted his work of righteousness. I have accepted his word of atonement. I have received in my body forgiveness of sins. I have received in my body the gift of the Holy Spirit. I am now following Jesus with all of my life, and I endeavor the whole world to know it. And I need to be strengthened in my spirit and strengthened in my mind and I need to have my hunger for the word grow and I want to follow him more faithfully. That's what we declare. That's what we proclaim when we come to this table. We love Jesus. We're grateful for the gospel and we want to follow him faithfully and have our spirit resensitized to his spirit even this morning. And Father, for those who have been walking in, in blatant and recurring sin, would you, would you check their heart and say, before you come up to the table, you clean it up with me in your heart. Father, would, there, would, would repentance rise even in this room? Would you grant forgiveness as we come back to the table, as you use the table to keep your people saved, to keep them focused on the cross? Lord, we celebrate together and collectively the grace of God in this room we love you, we celebrate you, we worship you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Let's lift our voice to the Lord and sing.